make sure my phone was on silent uh, after Kathy said that because I just thought maybe it was on. Um, I kind of feel like I should just sit down. I don't think there's anywhere for me to go except for down after Kathy's introduction because uh, I don't think I can be anywhere near as impressive as she made me out to be. Uh, but hopefully I won't disappoint you too badly. Uh, so as Kathy uh, introduced, uh, I've been teaching now for probably close to 15 years uh, in a variety of settings. So not just in a classroom, not just uh, at a university, but uh, outdoor education, uh, religious education. I've run seminars for, for schools uh, and things like that. So what we want these keynote lectures to be is about one of the biggest questions we get asked uh, in this course is, why would anybody ever want to study arts? So in the first week of academic skills, we had that conversation, am I right? So, so you talked about uh, well, the, all the jokes that get made about the arts and talked about you know, being a backdoor into university or a bachelor of attendance or study arts so you can be the most qualified person in the drive-thru. Um, and so why, why study arts? So can I just have a show of hands, just out of curiosity, how many of you sitting here have aspirations to one day be a teacher? So have a look around the room. Okay, uh, It's a lot of you. Now, why study arts? And that's what this question uh, we're hopefully going to answer today, is what value can an arts degree bring to you as a teacher? Why is it valuable? But ultimately, how is it going to get the most value for your future students? Okay. So we're going to do three out of four things. We're going to talk about why do you want to be a teacher? Okay. What is it that draws you to that profession? We're going to talk about, well, why would anybody want to be a teacher? I mean, think about your high school teachers for a minute. Think about what you put them through. Uh, I think about my high school teachers and think what I put them through and I think, why on earth did I submit myself to the same thing? Uh, I'm going to talk about what is your responsibility as a teacher? Because believe it or not, it's not all just laughter and, and wonderful days and school holidays. Uh, you have a responsibility as an educator. So what is that? And finally, how will an arts degree help you achieve that? So that's what we're going to do today. And at the end, we're going to have a Q&A where it's your chance to ask questions. But the biggest question, how to study in arts? How to study in sociology, history, English, politics. How can this help you as being a teacher? Is it just a stepping stone or does it have value for the future? So, first of all, can I have a show of hands again, everybody who wants to be a teacher? I'm going to do this a few times, so get used to it. I hope your arms doesn't get too tired. Um, okay, now you put your hand down. Out of those people who just had your hands up, I want to know why. Why do you want to be a teacher? Someone sing something out to me. What was that? I love kids, okay? Good answer. I like working with kids, it's good. Other answers? Inspire. What's that? Inspire. You want to inspire young people? Okay, great answer. Somebody else? To educate. To educate, okay? And we're going to think about what that means. What does it mean to educate somebody? Other answers? Make a difference in the world. Make a difference in the world. Man, you guys are giving really, really great answers. Can I get some really honest answers though? <laughs> because I think there are other reasons people want to become teachers. Okay? The most common. Thank you. It's school holidays. 16 weeks holidays a year. Uh, do you know, guys know what an average full-time employee gets in holidays a year? How many weeks? Four, five if you're really, really lucky. Um, and that's paid holidays, so obviously casual employees don't get holidays at all. So 16 weeks holiday a year? Sounds pretty good, right? What are some of the other reasons? What time does school start? Nine o'clock. What time does it knock off? Three o'clock. Sounds pretty good. Six hour working day, I'll take that. Uh, most people work eight hours. So, you know, there's another one. What about the money? A lot of people go, well, it's, it's a good introduction to, uh, uh, to, to life. $65,000 as a graduate is not a bad income. Uh, you can earn up to $100,000 as a classroom teacher. And obviously it goes up from there as head teachers. Uh, and the final one, which was our first answer, is I like kids. Uh, these are some of the most common answers that I get when I ask people why they want to be teachers. But unfortunately, if this is the reason that you want to be a teacher, these are the wrong reasons to go into it. I like kids is obviously better than the other three, uh, but it's not going to sustain you through an education career. So the question I want to ask is, well, why would anybody want to be a teacher? So this is a study that was uh, released in 2005. Uh, have a read of that. It says that 25%, between 25% and 40% of beginning teachers in the Western world burn out and leave the profession within the first year. Between 25% and 40%. So everyone put your hand up again. Who's going to be a teacher? Half of you. 
will be gone within a year, on average. The average uh, uh, attrition rate or teachers leaving the profession is between 3 to 8% of teachers, which means that every year 10% of teachers quit. And these aren't retiring teachers, these aren't teachers that have reached the end of their career and are moving on. These are teachers who, before the age of retirement, have quit and moved on to another profession. So, what are some of the reasons you think that happens? So, so again, throw answers out. What are some of the reasons? Yeah. Stress. What's that? Stress. Stress, okay. So, so stress. What else? What's that? Bored. Bored, okay. So, so teachers might get bored with the material. Absolutely. Other ideas? They can't handle Pressure. Pressure? Okay, so the pressure of it. Someone over here? They can't handle the reality of it. They can't handle the reality of teaching, okay? So they thought, yeah, 16 weeks holidays, nine to three working day, the reality is suddenly very, very different. Any other ideas? Kids. What's that? Kids. Kids, yeah. I mean, you know, kids can be jerks. We all know it, we've all been there, we've all done it, we all saw that casual teacher work on, walk onto the playground and we went, haha, we're gonna make them cry today. Um, <laughs> we've, we've all been there, we've all had that thought, right? Now, think about it honestly for a moment. Would you have wanted to teach yourself when you were in high school? Would you have wanted to be your teacher? So, if we come back to this, the reality is, if this is the reason that you want to get into teaching, and I'm not being hard, or I am being harsh here, but I'm being honest, you need to consider a different career path. Because $100,000 at the top of, it's not enough to put up with what you have to put up with. The 9 to 3 working day is a myth. Do you know how many classes you teach in a day as a teacher? Depends on how many periods there are. Usually you get one period off a day. How much preparation do you think you'll get done in that one period a day? Do you think you'll get all your preparation done for that whole day? Of course not. Not even close. The reason that you get paid a decent amount, the reason it's 9 to 3 is because you're expected to do work. How many of you have family members that are teachers? Do they work a nine to three day? Do they get weekends off a lot? How often are they preparing lessons? How often are they marking? How often are they going to school functions? How often are they at these kind of school camps? How much time do they spend back at school organizing events? It's not a nine to three job. Now I'm not saying this to try to scare you off because obviously I'm a teacher, I love it, I'm passionate about it and I think it's one of the greatest professions we have. If you think of doctors, lawyers, engineers, everybody who goes to the workforce, most of them will trace their passion back to a high school teacher. Think of your favourite type of subject. And I'm, I'm willing to bet that you can all trace it back to a high school teacher that was passionate about what they taught. Am I right? And the teacher that stood there at the front going, oh, go to the textbook, uh, do page 23, I'm just going to be over here if you need me. They duck out of the classroom at every opportunity, they'd be flirting with the teacher next door, and, and you'd be bored, you'd be there. And I'm guaranteed that wasn't the class you wanted to sit in. So the reason I bring this up at the beginning, again, it's not to scare you off and it's not to, to make it seem horrible. It's because I want you to understand what you're choosing. If you're choosing teaching because you think it's an easy career path, Find something else to do, because it's not easy. And it takes passion, it takes dedication, and without those things, you're not going to sustain it. When you're in a room of kids swearing at you, screaming at you, running out of the room, Miss, can we use the computer? Sir, I want to play on the equipment. Sir, you suck. I hate you. Do you really think that that money is going to sustain you through that? Of course it's not. So what are some of the reasons that teachers do quit? So according to the same study, uh, number one is a lack of job satisfaction. Feeling like you're not achieving anything. Feeling like the students get worse year after year after year. You're not actually doing anything. Work overload. So again, that 9 to 3 day, forget about it. It doesn't exist. You'll be marking after school. You'll be uh, preparing lessons after school. Uh, the lack of feedback and support. The reality is that every teacher in a school, they've got their own business to do with, they've got their own classes to teach, and sometimes you end up in a school where every, it is every man for himself, every woman for himself. So you don't get that feedback that you desire, you don't have the people there to support you, and a lot of first year teachers feel extremely isolated. Think about the uh, administrative overload. So it's not just preparing lessons, it's grading papers, marking down uh, all of their work, it's Organising permission notes, organising athletes carnivals. This is all a part of your job as a teacher. 
It's not just the fun part where you get to stand in front of the kids and they all love you. Uh, it's not just, you know, Dangerous Minds or Dead Poets Society or Freedom Riders. It's not that moment where the, the kids have their whole life turned around and they thank the teacher, everyone cries, the credits roll, and it's all wonderful. It's not the way it works. You may have those moments in your career, but those movies often skip over all that hard work that has to be done before you get to that point. Uh, teaching without knowledge of the discipline, and this is a big one, and this is one we're going to talk about a lot today. Uh, okay, so again, hands up, you want to be a teacher? Uh, keep your hand up if you want to be a high school teacher. Hand down if you want to be a high school teacher. So a handful of people that want to be high school teachers. Okay, hands down. Um, you guys, believe it or not, you guys get the easy road. Because you get to specialise in a discipline. You get to become a history teacher, and you've studied history. You get to become a geography teacher, and you've studied geography. Primary school teachers, put your hand up. Do you know what you've got to teach? Everything. You have to be a history teacher. You have to be an English teacher. You have to be a maths teacher. How many people like maths? <laughs> okay, we're well, going to let fewer hands down. Okay? Uh, so, for all of you in the extended diploma uh, and the standard diploma, when you get to term three or four, you're going to have an elective called Maths Patterns of Relationship. You're going to look at it and go, I don't want to do that. I want to do the other subject. Maths is boring. If you're going to be a primary school teacher, you have to do that elective. Because one day, you're going to teach maths. One of the biggest causes of stress and teacher burnout is teachers teaching things that they don't feel qualified to teach. And it will happen sometimes. Sometimes you'll end up in a school where they go, I don't have an ancient history teacher. You taught modern history, you can do it. That's going to happen. And unfortunately, that's just the way it works out. But it's one of these factors that leads to teachers burning out. We have behavioural issues. So again, would you want to teach yourself? I know I wouldn't want to teach myself. Um, as Kathy introduced, she was very kind and she glossed over the fact when she said I didn't get into a university. It wasn't just that I didn't get into a university, I didn't get into any university. Uh, my ASR was so bad, they looked at me and went, yeah, no, sorry. Uh, maybe try, like, anyone seen the movie with Billy Madison, where he goes back to primary school? That was kind of where I was at. Um, so, but the reality is that I was that child. I was that kid that mucked up. I was the kid that taped dusters to the ceiling fan, so when they went on, they threw everywhere. Um, because I didn't get the value of school. Now, in part, I look back on that and I reflect on my teachers, but at the same time, it was my responsibility as well. I want you to look at those things up there. Because they're career. And this is what's leading to nearly half first-year teachers leaving the profession within the first year. Imagine that. You study for five years to become something. And within a year, you pack it in, and you go and find something new to do. Five years of your life, done. These are the things that you've got to consider as you move into a teacher. I promise it gets happier from here, I promise. Um, but I want you to understand the, the reality of it up front. So I want to ask you this question. What are you going to do differently? What are you going to do so that you don't end up one of the 50%? What are you going to do so that you're not burning out within the first year or ever? How are you going to approach it differently? Because we've all got uh, to come up with strategies now. Believe it or not, this is the easier time of your life. Uh, believe it or not, uh, when you get into teaching, it doesn't get easier, it gets harder. Okay? So what are you going to do differently so that you don't fall into that 50% who leave the employment within the first year? I want you to think for a moment about your worst teacher in high school. Um, and just out of curiosity, um, can I have a show of hands and you don't have to put your hand up for this, but you might want to. How many of you guys look back on your school career and hold one of your teachers directly responsible for your performance in the HSC? <laughs> okay. And so we've got you know, a third of the room. We've probably got another third of the room that are too shy to put their hand up because they think I'm taking names. They're going, oh, okay, okay. Um, not the way it works. But I want you to think about that. That, that you look back on your school career and you look at a teacher and you say, you know what, I didn't do as well in my HSC because of that teacher. But here you are now sitting here, maybe that's the motivation you have for wanting to be a teacher. Maybe that's why you've taken on this profession. Because you go, I want to undo the mistakes that my teacher did. And I want to help students in a way that I never got help. I want you to think about that teacher. I want you to think about the way that they engaged in a classroom. I want you to think about the way they behaved in a the classroom. I want you to think about the way were they prepared? 
Were they not prepared? Did they know what they were talking about? Or did it seem like they were constantly guessing? Did they know answers and talk about things? Or did they read from a textbook? Were their classes interesting? Or were they boring? We're going to talk about that teacher, that hypothetical teacher in a minute. But before that, I want you to think about your favourite teacher. So how many of you look back on your school career and remember one teacher really, really, really fondly? How many of you have that experience? How many of you keep your hand up if you're still interested in that subject now? Okay. Do you see the correlation? How many of you who hold that teacher directly responsible are still interested in the subject that they taught? A few of you? You didn't put your hand up the first time, so we've got uh, a disconnect there. Uh, so, the teachers that engage you, the teachers that are interesting, the teachers that are passionate, they're the ones that get you involved. They're the ones that go, I want to study this in long term. I want to teach other people about this. They're the ones that, that draw, you, draw you in. If you can't tell, these are all movie characters, by the way. Those of you who are in my classroom know that I'm a massive nerd and talk about movies constantly. Um, so I want us to now consider, well, what is the job of a teacher? Okay, We're going to come back to this idea of a good teacher and a bad teacher. Um, and I want to think about, well, what is your role? So there is a, a traditional method of teaching of education. Uh, and it's referred to as the banking method of education. Now, the banking education is the way that it was pretty much when I went through school. It would have been the way it was when your parents went through school, unless they had a really outstanding teacher. And I'm sure some of you have experienced this as well. The banking method of education describes students as empty vessels, like a piggy bank. Okay? And the teacher's job is to come along and fill them up with knowledge. Okay? So your, your students know nothing, your teacher knows everything, in comes the teacher, fills you up with knowledge, you then walk away, and now you're a smart person. Okay? What's the problem with that theory? Everyone learns differently, absolutely, that's part of it. Would any of you, sorry, go? Okay, so that, that, but, but in this method, a lot of students actually come away, they pass tests, they, uh, they remember things because they get filled up. How many of you would consider yourselves empty vessels? Really? You're completely empty? You have no experience in life? You don't have any knowledge? You don't, you don't look at the world? You don't engage with the world? Of course you do. None of you are empty vessels because no human is empty vessels. We all have an understanding of the world. We all understand uh, the world that we engage with. Now, teachers that come to students assuming they know nothing are automatically solid, starting with a faulty premise. Because students may have simplistic understanding, they may have uh, an incorrect understanding, but they have an understanding. Now, uh, a guy by the name of Paulo Freire uh, wrote a book and it's called uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Don't worry about that word, it's, it's a rubbish made up <coughs> word. Um, and you'll learn it when you do your teaching degree. Um, but he wrote this book based on uh, Brazil and working in South America. And what he argues is that in places where people are in abject poverty, where people um, who are oppressed by the, the ruling class, education is a key to get them out of that. The education frees people. Um, that education is a, a, a ticket out of a, a life um, of suffering. Now, in Sydney, we can kind of relate to that a little bit. So, just in the room, how many uh, people in the room are like first in their family to go to university? That's a lot. Uh, I can guarantee if you ask that same question at Sydney University, uh, the numbers will be way down. If you ask in New South Wales, the numbers will be way down. Um, one thing that we pride ourselves on here is providing the opportunity to people who don't have a history of going to university. Their family, first in family, is a really big deal. You should be really proud of yourself because you're a forerunner in your family. And for your kids, going to university will seem a little bit easier. And their kids, it'll seem like it's normal. But here's the thing. Using knowledge, it's how we use this knowledge. So when he talks about the banking method of education, he says that knowledge is a gift. It's bestowed upon by those who consider themselves knowledgeable, the teachers, on those who know nothing, the students. Okay? In this method, who is it all about? So read the screen. Who's it all about? What's that? It's about the teacher. 
It's about the teacher justifying their existence. I'm smart, you're dumb. I know everything, you know nothing. I'm the teacher, you're the student. Okay? How many of you have had that experience? You get to think of putting your hands up, aren't you? Which is, which is fair enough. Maybe I'm just like, I need to put a foot in the air or try something different. Um, but we've had that experience where the teacher walks into a room as the expert. Now, obviously, a teacher's going to know more than you because they've studied this. Well, I hope a teacher will know more than you when they've studied this. Okay? But as educators, we should be coming to students where they are, engaging with what they already know instead of assuming that they know nothing. Now, if you're going to become a teacher because of all those reasons we spoke about at the beginning, you know, the, the holidays, the six-day working day that doesn't exist, um, the, uh, the great pay packet, which when you work it out on an hourly rate isn't really that great, uh, or if you want to do it because you like authority, then again, you're in the wrong career because the students won't respond to you. Your life will be a living hell. They will respond exactly the way you responded to those teachers when they did that to you. Um, so I want to think about one approach that, that works. Um, and this is a, an approach that I guess I've sort of developed over my time and also when I was studying. So I didn't learn about Paulo Freire by doing a teaching degree. Uh, I learned about Paulo Freire by doing an arts degree. I was in a sociology subject I did at Sydney University where I learned about this. Um, and I developed my teaching philosophy out of this. Uh, and on top of that, this is a description that a guy who wrote a book, um, and I'm going to talk about who he is in a minute, I don't want to give his name because it kind of ruins it. Um, this is the way he wanted to develop students. So he spoke that his key goal was the development of students who were creative, confident problem solvers. They wanted to be so automatic in their fundamentals, so in the basic of what they knew, that they were ready to devise their own situation. So how many of you had academic skills ready this week? Some of you? Uh, some of you would have looked at um, the, uh, you know, the triangle table that we looked at. Uh, yeah, you know what it was called? What was that? Hierarchy. It was a hierarchy. I don't know what it was called. What was that? Thank you, someone's paying attention. Okay, so Bloom's taxonomy, does that ring a bell? And it goes up, and we start with base order things where we're just remembering, and we go all the way up to where we're actually able to create things out of the information from the bottom. That's what this is talking about, in action. Those who haven't had academic skills yet, you'll do it later in the week, I'm assuming. I'm hoping. Um, so they wanted their students to understand the basics so well that when a new problem ar ar arose, ar arrived, arose, well done, uh, arrived, <laughs> They could take the knowledge they had here, they could change it, fix it, and apply it to this. Now, does that sound like what a student should be able to do? So when you're in cultural perspectives and you're doing race theory, and then you see uh, an article which talks about something to do with it, you should be able to take that base knowledge, think about it, mould it, synthesise it, put it there, and apply it to that. The only problem is that this isn't talking about students. Uh, this is actually talking about athletes. So this is written by a coach uh, that coaches an uh, American college basketball team. And he's talking about his players. He's talking about uh, the people that he coaches. Because one of the biggest things for me when I think about teaching is that my job is not just to fill you up with knowledge like the banking method says. Because at the end of the day, you have knowledge, you don't have knowledge. It's kind of all the same. My job uh, is to teach you the discipline required to learn these things yourself. So let me give you an example. On my first teaching track, uh, I studied uh, ancient history and modern history in my arts degree. Uh, and I, I was fairly confident in it. I went to my first track. Uh, two weeks before I started, I sat down with the teacher. And the teacher said, OK, this is what you're going to be teaching. I opened it up, and it said, you're going to be teaching the Aztecs. I looked at it and went, I have never looked at the Aztecs in my entire life. I haven't studied it, I haven't read about them, I know nothing about it. Now I'm going to have to stand in front of a year 9 class at Granville Boys High School and try to teach them about the Aztecs. Now I went away and I spent two weeks researching, reading, putting together a program so that I could teach them. Now, I'd never studied the Aztecs, but during my time at university, I had learned how to research. I would learned how to read history. I had learned the basics so that when I had to go and study something new, I knew how to do that question for all of you. 
if you don't like reading, if you don't like researching, if you don't like studying, again, you're choosing the wrong profession. Because the best teachers are also the best learners. To stay up to date, to stay current, to make sure that you're teaching uh, the, the most update information, you've got to be able to have these basics, these fundamentals. You've got to have the discipline to be able to keep updating your stuff. Or do you want to be that teacher that's taught the same syllabus for the last 25 years, uh, the same information, and just sitting there going, well, this is exactly the same as it's always been. You haven't changed anything. This isn't new. The examples they use are from when they were young. The, the movies they talk about are from when they were young. They don't update anything because their basics aren't there. So I want you to consider this idea. The coaches, the so athletic coaches, are in the business of maxi maximising performance through developing discipline. As a teacher, that's your number one job. is to develop student discipline. Not just to give them information, but teach them how to find information. You ever heard that, you know, that really lame expression you said on Facebook? The, you know, give a man a fish, leave for a day, teach a man to fish, and he'll never go hungry again? It's that kind of idea. Okay? If you just hand the students knowledge, well, they will only be able to learn if you're giving it to them. You teach them the discipline required okay, to reach a performance standard where you can go and find that knowledge for yourself. That's when you have done your job. That's what being a teacher is about. It's not just about filling up students, empty vessels. It's about creating people who are able to think. And this is the most important part. is developing people who are able to think. Because education can be a tool for good, or it can be a tool for bad. Education, has anyone ever heard the expression that education is indoctrination? Does anyone know what indoctrination means? Mm -hmm. to, it's basically to brainwash someone. Yeah, to brainwash. And, and uh, regimes and dictatorships and even democracies have used this tool of education to preach a line, to make people think the way they want them to think. So nobody questions, no one argues, no one goes against the grain, and everything works fine for the government because people get pushed down and down and down and down. Our job as educators, number one, is to teach people to think, and to think for themselves, to be critical of each other, to be critical of their teacher even. And that might be something that you go, well, wait, how does that work? Like, if I criticise my teacher, I'll get sent out. Well, no, that's not the way it works at all. If you do it appropriately, if you do it with evidence, if you go, hey, look, you're saying this, like, you're talking about this, but my experience doesn't match up with what you're saying. When I go to work, they don't treat me like that. So can you explain that to me? That's what critical engagement is about. And at this point in history, it has never been more important to be treating people like this. Now, one of the things that has been said a lot over or well, since November is... Um, People talking a lot about the election of Donald Trump. And people talking about uh, how did he get elected? How did we ever elect that guy? How did he ever become a president? And part of the issue is that we're not engaging critical thinkers. We're not teaching people to think for themselves. And I want to give you an example of this. Um, and if you're in my academic skills class from the river and you're sitting here, I apologise, you've seen this before, but uh, I'm sure you'll be fine. Um, I want us to consider this article that was published uh, a few weeks back. Now, there is some bad language in here, uh, and I apologise for that. Um, I'm not going to read the bad language, but it's going to be on the screen, so you can just like, block your ears and pretend you can hear it. Um, but we're all out, so you should be fine. Um, so, I want you to consider this Facebook thread. So, uh, this came out uh, not long after the election, uh, does anyone know what the, so the, the, the caption was happening in this image? Somebody? Where is this? Okay, so there's the repeal of Obamacare in the US. Um, okay, so what happened was after, Obama, after um, Donald Trump got elected, he said the first thing he's going to do is repeal Obamacare. He's going to get rid of it. Uh, and a lot of people went, yay, we're getting rid of Obamacare. So this guy, uh, whose name's blocked out, uh, he said, he updated his Facebook status. One step closer okay, to fixing a terrible mistake. Uh, only a couple of weeks of Barry's regime is referring to Obama there. Um, 2017 is already looking up. So this guy, is he for Obamacare, against Obamacare? Yeah. Against Obamacare. Doesn't like it, thinks it's rubbish, thinks we've got to get rid of it. Okay? If we scroll down, uh, one of his friends, cool of you to treat all of us who need 
Uh, the assistance provided by the ACA, the ACA stands for the Affordable Care Act, okay, um, really sells the whole underlying theme of Republicans acting like vindictive. Uh, for every perceived slight at the hands of Democrats these past eight years, it's a party that now openly celebrates the misfortune of others while simultaneously patting themselves on the back for making progress. Okay, so this guy, for Obamacare, against Obamacare? For, and against who? The original person. Okay, so we have a critical kind of engagement discussion going on here. So we scroll down a little bit further. And the original poster is flabbergasted. He doesn't understand. Jesus, where do I start? We're talking about Obamacare, not the ACA. Secondly, my health insurance is through the ACA. So I'm definitely not the kind of person who would look down on others for needing help. I'm just saying, I'm glad this has finally happened because Obamacare was a failure from the start. Remember healthcare.gov? If you didn't know what that was, the website actually crashed on the very first night that they uh, launched it, which wasn't great. Uh, all of this was the brainchild of liberals, and they couldn't even get the site to run right. So why should any of us have had uh, faith they could get socialised healthcare right? We didn't, and they couldn't. Again, it was a mistake that's finally being fixed. What's his argument? What's that? So still against, and he's saying, well, I'm on the ACA, the Affordable Care Act. I, I'm, you know... Uh, I understand what it's like to suffer, so I wouldn't judge anybody who's on Obamacare. What's the problem? Well, wait. If you're on Obamacare, why though? Are you celebrating the outcome of this vote? If the Republicans get their way, uh, get what they want, you'll lose your insurance. Our original poster comes back. I'm not on Obamacare. My health insurance is through the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, which was... Uh, what they had to come up with after Obamacare crashed so badly. So I'm going to be fine. The only problem... You can read that for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and now our original commenter comes back. No, seriously, are you kidding me? They're the same thing. Obamacare is just a stupid name for the ACA that Republicans came up with to make moronic voters like you automatically despise the idea of it just by hearing the name, and it worked, I guess. <laughs> Somebody else jumps in? Jesus Christ, original vote poster? Seriously? All this time and you never once checked for yourself to see what was up with the whole Obamacare controversy. Didn't once bother asking if relying solely on Glenn Beck for your political commentary might not be uh, the best use of all the resources you have at your disposal. Uh, his friends go on to have a conversation here. Do you think he'll respond? No, why would you? Dude, I can't believe he's deleted it. If this was me, I would have deleted my whole Facebook and never been seen again. Um, <laughs> now, we, we laugh at this, and this is funny, okay? I, you know, it's, it's, it's humorous. But there's also a tragedy to this, a real tragedy that this person voted for somebody who was actively working against their interests. And they didn't vote for them because they weighed the good and bad, they weighed them because they didn't weigh anything. They watched some television shows, they listened to some friends, they may have listened to a university lecturer, and they decided, based on what they heard, yeah, that sounds pretty good, I'm gonna vote for that. And there are people uh, all over America and there are people all over Britain in this same situation now who have voted for people who are actively working against their interests because they didn't understand the situation. Now, don't hear me saying that anyone who voted for Trump is, is stupid. So I'm not saying that. And I'm not saying that anyone who voted for him is uneducated. I'm not saying that either. What I'm talking about here are the countless people that since the election have since come out to say if they could vote again right now, they would change their mind. And the reason they would change their mind is because when they voted, they didn't understand the situation. They didn't understand. If you're a Twitter person, go look up the hashtag Trump regrets. Uh, look up the hashtag uh, Brexit regrets. And you will find literally thousands and thousands and thousands of people who are now saying, I wish I didn't vote. I voted for this reason and it was stupid. I wish I had have considered it more before I went into the voting booth. Now, at the end of the day, if people go into the voting booth having thought about what they're going to vote for, having thought and weighed up both sides, they vote for Donald Trump and he gets elected, that's democracy. That's the way it should work. I don't have, you don't have to like the person that's elected. I'm not talking about the people who weighed up both sides and made an educated decision. 
What I'm talking about here are the people who since have come out to say, I wouldn't have voted that way if only I had thought about it before I voted. How many of you are 18? You guys will be voting at our next election. You guys are fresh out of high school. Um, most of us make our decision on who we're going to vote for. Uh, I'm assuming when I was your age, I just listened to my parents and did what they said they should do. Uh, I listened to a celebrity and said, did what they thought I should do. Um, but the reality is that 18-year-olds will be hugely responsible for electing our next government. Now, if our high schools aren't preparing people to think critically, if our high school teachers aren't engaged, you don't have to be discussing politics in a high school class, but we need to be developing the skill, the ability to think critically. And all of you who said you want to be teachers, again, put your hands up. Every single one of you have a responsibility to do this. It's not just about extra holidays, short working day, decent pay. If that's why you're doing it, again, I'll reiterate it. I've said it over and over and over again. Find another career because you'll be dissatisfied. You'll be on that list that we spoke about at the beginning. You have a responsibility as a teacher to teach people to think critically, to engage with what's in front of you. And the question is, why do we study an arts degree? Well... I'm going to take that down because that means really irritating me. <laughs> Every time I see it over my shoulder, I feel like I'm being watched. Um, I kind of am, but I shouldn't have been watched from behind. But, uh, it's not the way it is. So, so again, that, that idea of, of people walking away with not knowing what they're talking about, that's terrifying. It's terrifying that we could elect a government based on, on nothing. So with high school teachers, can I, can I encourage you, if this is your job, you do have a responsibility to do this. So what... So what, are, what is a teacher's job? A teacher's job is to teach students to think critically. Now how do you do that? What does that look like? So you've spoken a little bit about critical thinking already, and we often throw this term around. What, are, what does critical thinking mean? Well, that's what I want to talk about now. Is what does it look like to think critically? Well, number one is that I don't think you can teach someone to think critically in the same way you can teach somebody to write uh, handwrite or to spell. You can't teach them how to do that in the same way you can develop um, a skill. Critical thinking comes out of a critical culture. So if you were raised in a family where you were taught to question things, if your family where, where the answer, so my father, uh, well, it was, you know, he's an interesting guy. Uh, if you're in my cultural perspective, class, you'll hear all about him repeatedly. Um, but for me growing up, because I because was never an answer that was satisfactory. If he asked me why I was doing something, so I'm just doing it because, it was never satisfactory. I was always having to justify everything I did, which as a 14-year-old was incredibly frustrating, and our relationship reflected that. But what it did was it, in, it, it imbued in me a sense of responsibility, of criticalness, where that... I grew up as a critical person because I was raised in a critical culture. Your classrooms have to be the same thing. They have to be a critical environment. They have to be an environment where we're taught to question. So it's not just enough to say, in Australian studies, we went to the Vietnam War, uh, it ended in 1973, Australian soldiers came home. What's the critical question we've got to ask them? Is it enough to learn the dates, the times, when it happened, where it happened? What's the critical question that's not been asked? Why did we go there in the first place? Okay. Why were we there? Should we have been there in the first place? Is that going to impact it? How did then when we think about going to Vietnam and relate that information to Iraq and Afghanistan? Should we have been there? Shouldn't we have learnt our lessons from that part? The critical question is essential to us. Not just what happened, why. John Passmore talks about this uh, in the article listed at the bottom on teaching to be critical. Where he says, you cannot just teach people to be critical unless you are critical yourself. If you want to be a teacher, your responsibility is to teach critical thinking. You cannot do that if you're not critical. And it's not like there are critical people and not critical people. This is a culture that can be developed. Okay, It's an attribute that can be developed. How do you develop it? You develop it right now in your afternoon. When you're sitting in class and a topic comes up, you discuss it, you engage with it, you get involved. This is how you learn to be critical. When I say something, you don't just take it in and, and you know, 
let it wash over you, you put your hand up and you say, look, I'm sorry, I, I think what you're saying is bullshit. I think you've missed a point. Okay? Like, you should be doing that. You're university students, you're adults, and you should be questioning things. Just because I'm a lecturer, just because your teachers have PhDs or whatever, does not mean they know everything. It does not mean they know your experience. And you should be questioning. A teacher has to apply what he calls arbitrary rules. So arbitrary rules, like you have to wear a uniform in a high school. Okay, It's arbitrary. It's a rule that they made up and it's there. Every teacher has to do that. And we've got to understand it. But he said the difference between an educator and an indoctrinator, remember we talked about indoctrination before, is that the educator understands that not all rules are valuable. That sometimes rules need to be dealt with the way they should be. So a school rule says we wear a tie. Okay, you've got your tie on. The educator says, look, you've got to wear a tie because it's part of school rules. It's because we can recognise you, we can identify you as a student, uh, and because some students can't afford to wear you know, their own clothes every day, we make you wear a uniform so that everybody's equal and no one's going to get made fun of because, you know, here I am wearing Kmart shoes and there you are wearing Nikes. Okay? Um, and that was my experience in high school. But, he says, that's what the educator does. The indoctrinator says, you wear a tie because it's the rules. And that's what the rules say, so that's what you do. An educator says, you know what? It's 38 degrees today, it's really hot, you can take your tie off. An indoctrinator says, you know what? That's the rules you leave your tie on. I don't care if you're sweating. This is the difference. A critical thinker looks at the rule, interprets the rule, and decides the value of the rule, and questions the rule. And this is essential for a society to function. This week, you're going to be looking at uh, the article, um, The Banality of Evil. And you're going to be talking about a, a variety of things in there. Um, one thing that I want you to consider is that when bad things happen in this world, when evil happens in this world, it's not usually because crazy people do crazy things. Sometimes reasonable people do crazy things. Sometimes they follow a bad crowd. Uh, you, how many of you sat in one of those peer pressure lectures in high school? And how many of you actually listened? Yeah, put your hands down, everybody. Um, but peer pressure comes out of an inability for us to think critically when we follow the crowd. And believe it or not, it doesn't get easier when you get older. It actually gets harder. Following the crowd becomes more um, ingrained in you. Being uh, uh, conforming to the structure becomes more ingrained. Um, but I want you to consider that good people do bad things. And there's an expression that, that goes a while back, and it's been attributed to a few different people. But it says that all that, uh, all that is required for evil to succeed in the world... Does anyone know how it finishes? Anyone know how that sentence finishes? What was that? Someone mumbled it. She said, say it again. Say it again? Uh, all, thank you. Uh, all that is required for evil to succeed in the world is... Well, for good people to do nothing. Okay? But you're close enough. Uh, it actually says for good men to do nothing, but because it was so long ago that you know men were the only people that did anything good, so that's why, of course, they did it. Uh, but we changed that now to good people to do nothing. And for good people to do something, though, it requires critical thinking. It requires someone to say, you know what, the fact we've always done it this way is not good enough. We live in a time in Australia now where our, uh, there are people in our government who are asking us to just follow the line. And there's going to come a time in the near future where people have to stand up and say, you know what, we don't like what you're doing. Um, just because that's the way we've always done it is not satisfactory for us to continue to do it. So, the PowerPoint just died, but that's okay, I can finish without it. Oh, there it is. Um, so this final question of how will studying arts help? If you're sitting here and wondering why you're doing an arts degree, the question I'll ask you is when you become a teacher, what are you going to teach? I mean, physically, what are you going to teach? Um, right now, do you think you have enough knowledge to walk into a history class and teach history? Do you think you have enough knowledge of literature to walk into an English class and teach English? Well, no, you need something to teach to be a teacher. Learning to be a teacher, believe it or not, in some ways that's the easy part. Uh, learning, walk into a classroom, I mean, anyone can do that. How well you do is a different story. But you can go in there. Um, bad teachers keep jobs, believe it or not. It's, it's amazing, but it happens. Um, 
What are you going to teach? What are you going to give your students? I want you to go back to that question I asked you at the very, very beginning uh, about your good teacher and your bad teacher. Now, the teacher that you, you didn't like, I'm going to assume that they walk into a classroom, they gave you a sheet or a textbook, they told you what page you should be looking at, they said, read this paragraph, answer these questions. Or they wrote a blackboard or a whiteboard filled up with, does anyone have blackboards anymore? Sorry, I'm showing my age here. Um, they filled up a board with, with writing, they put up three comprehension questions, they said, do that. And then they sat at their desk on their phone. Or they sat there marking papers. And you were bored, right? Now, flip over to the teacher that you really admire, the teacher that you really like. Think about them for a minute and the way that they taught. Now, I'm going to assume that they came into the classroom and said, okay, we're going to be talking about this today. They spoke about it. You asked a question, they went, that's a really interesting question. Actually, here's the answer. And it's kind of like, you know how last week in the news we saw blah, 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 blah? Well, that's an example of this. Or they said, did you see that movie that came out last year? Well, that movie's actually about this. They made connections to the world you're living in. You know why they were able to do that? Because they valued education as a continuous process. They were still learning. They were still seeing those connections. The teacher that sat at their desk and gave you a textbook, when you asked them a question, I bet nine times out of ten, they said, read page 22. Yeah. Or they panicked and went, oh, God, oh, here it is. Uh, yeah, look, it says right here that the, the war started in... Oh, yeah. The reason was because when they did their arts degree, I'm willing to bet they didn't take it seriously. They thought... I want to be a teacher, I don't need to study history. I want to be a teacher, I don't need to study English, sociology, it's all rubbish. But what you're learning right now are the things that you're going to teach one day when you're in a classroom. The difference between an interesting, engaging teacher and a teacher who relies on a textbook is how well they did here. And I'm not talking about the grades, but what I am talking about is how much you learned and how much you learned how to learn. So if you don't like reading, if you don't like researching, if you think studying is just something you've got to do for now, teaching is not the place you want to be because you will be studying for the rest of your life, provided you don't end up like one of those teachers in the first uh, year who, who drops out. But I want you to consider that. Now, before you pack up and see something packing up, relax, it's all right, we can go in a minute. But uh, before we get there, though, I do want to open it up to questions. Because, look, some of the stuff I've said today may sit uncomfortable with you, and that's good. Okay? Um, so this is your opportunity to ask questions, your opportunity to, to, to disagree if you disagree. Or you might want to ask practical questions about the profession um, or how your course directly links. But do we have questions? And don't feel like you can't ask questions because people are packing up. Like, don't let them rob you of your learning experience. So, uh, I saw a hand there. What else about the Bachelor of Arts gateway to students might be interested? So, think of a, a Bachelor of Arts as a, a gateway degree. Okay? So, in some ways, uh, from Bachelor of Arts, you can go on to study psychology. Uh, you can go on to study uh, any sort of postgrad course you can go into with a Bachelor of Arts as a basis. So people go into law from Bachelor of Arts, they go into psychology. Um, people do um, uh, postgrad studies in a variety of things. Because what it, what it shows is it provides you with a basis for study. It proves to another university or to this university, you know how to study. So when you go into a postgrad, uh, that's your opportunity. Guys, can we just keep the conversation to a minimum because I'm answering questions. You'll be over pretty soon. Um, the other options are you can go into academia. Uh, you can work in uh, museums, places like that. You can go into policy or politics. Uh, you can do honours where you will uh, write a thesis and from there you can go on to do research work. The, core, the purpose of these keynote lectures is to help you connect. So this one's on teaching. Uh, we're going to have somebody else from another profession in the next one who's going to talk about how their arts degree helped them in their profession. And then the next one, someone from a different profession. They're going to talk about how their arts degree helped them in that profession. Um, but what I will say to that even if some of you, let's say you finish your arts degree, you get married, you have children, and you decide you're going to be a stay-at-home dad, uh, or you're going to be a stay-at-home mum, and you never go on to do the thing you thought you were going to do right now, your arts degree will be valuable. If for no other reason that when you work in, walk into a voting booth, you're going to know who you're going to vote for, because it's based on information. Or, even if it's as simple as you're sitting down in the pub having a drink and you sound more interesting, 
Um, you know, even if it's that simple, an arts degree will have value, okay? Because it, it helps us think about the world in a way that we should be. Other questions? Yes? I'm not being negative. I'm a te obviously, I'm a teacher. So, um, I, I love the profession. But I think we've got to be realistic about it. Those, those stats, they're not um, up for interpretation. That's, they're numbers. That's real. 40-something um, percent of first-year teachers are dropping out in their first year. Um, and I think part of it is because teachers are going into it with an unrealistic expectation of what teaching will involve. I love teaching. I'm passionate about teaching. And I want to make sure the right people are going into teaching. Not just anybody looking for a free holiday. Um, so I might sound negative, and if I do, I apologise. Like, because like I said, I'm a passionate teacher. It's what I've wanted to do my whole life. But we need to be realistic about why we're teaching. Um, because, again, you don't want to waste the next four years of your life doing something that you're going to throw away after the first year, or second year, or third year. Does that make sense? Anyone else? Uh, please feel free to, to grab me after. Oh, wait, 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 one more. And everybody cringes going, ah! What was that? For the exact same reason that bad bus drivers exist, and bad doctors exist, uh, and bad uh, people in every profession exist. That uh, sometimes getting a job is less based on what you do as a skill, uh, and more about the way you interview. Guys, give it down to one more second, we're not finished. Um, so yeah. Alright, thank you very much guys. Uh, I'll see you.